Welcome to the Impact on the Ground with Tia. I'm the CEO of a tech for good company and passionate about making a difference. This podcast series will dig deeper into what it means to make an impactful change in society, whether you are an individual, charity, social enterprise, company or grant maker. It is all about collaboration and finding the right partners. And we are here to talk what this means in practice. We focus in our conversations on the dynamics between those who have resources to give and those who are working to tackle the challenges in our society on the ground. So today uh, in Impact on the Ground, we have a guest, Fergus Bell from Fathom, which is a news lab company. Welcome, Fergus. Uh, hi, dear. Nice to be here. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you too. So today we discuss about misinformation and fake news and uh, their role in our societal matters. So whether it's uh, uh, societal well-being, environmental issues, uh, politics, and Fergus is a specialist in fake news and has worked around the globe tackling the fake news. Could you tell a little bit about Fathom and your previous work? Yes, so Fathom is a, we're an independent news lab and consultancy, and we work with newsrooms, news organizations, and uh, any other types of organizations that touch on that, on the news and publishing industry. Uh, and we help them do things better and do things faster. And a lot of that uh, revolves around workflows and uh, digital transformation, but also a lot around countering misinformation. My background and uh, my co-founder's background come from news verification, uh, 10, 15 years of experience doing that, starting in the Arab Spring, and in the early days of social media. Uh, and as that has morphed from verifying videos from a war zone into uh, verifying factual information and fact checking um, and political fact checking and health fact checking. Um, and all of the thing, all of the ways that the, uh, the ecosystem has evolved to, to where we are now in 2021. Yeah, so uh, what is fake news and is there also fake news in traditional media or is this now more of a, like a social media problem? So fake news is a, well, firstly, fake news is a, a phrase that Donald Trump invented. Uh, and and so it's it's a bit difficult to to talk about something that was that was created, you know, a concept that was created by him. Uh, within news and journalism, we talk about misinformation and disinformation. Um, and misinformation and disinformation are, are basically uh, two, two uh, different types of information that are that are wrong, but have different intents behind them. So misinformation is something that is wrong, but it could be a mistake, it could be a rumor, it could be Chinese whispers that are, are spreading around, taken out of context, whereas disinformation is something that is deliberately designed to um, misinform someone. Um, so that is where we see a, a campaign by a bad actor or someone purposely putting out that kind of information for political or economic uh, gain. Mm. So what could be um, examples of this disinformation uh, and what it has caused cause to certain societal issues or societies or communities, uh, kind of negative aspects of it? So disinformation is, is much more calculating. And, and the most examples we see of that are in um, in political contexts or con or and I say politics, but I, I guess I mean politics in its broader sense. So that could be uh, health, it could be climate, it could be um, the the use of fossil fuels, it, it could be around elections. So um, disinformation, you hear of disinformation campaigns more commonly in relation to. Um, elections that are groups of people putting out information in order to get you to vote in one way in order to to sway an election and the way that it happens can be very subtle um, and but but the goal is the same it, it's simply when someone is at that ballot box and they are choosing who to vote for they choose potentially differently to how they would have done um, and that is this that is the sole aim for a lot of it um, Misinformation would be 
the classic example of, oh, I saw this video on social media and so it must be true. Now, that video on social media may have been five years old from a completely different context, um, but it backs up your beliefs and where we see the prop with this kind of combination of misinformation with social media is that it's mixed with an algorithm. So you see something that you like, it could be old, it could be wrong, but it backs up your beliefs and it's within your, within your algorithmic filter bubble. And so it's that combination that makes things a lot trickier to undo and makes misinformation, I guess, more effective um, at, at changing opinions or, or uh, creating division or pitching you on one side of an argument against another. And I guess we've been seeing also this in, in racial issues. Uh, lots of different kind of stories related to uh, a hate crime. And yes. You, 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 see, you see these things anywhere where there is division, basically. So misinformation you see um, pop up when there, is, when there is division. It could be around um, race issues. It could be around Black Lives Matter protests uh, where you would see a, a photo of someone doing something positive or negative depending on what what you what side you came on or what you were um, predisposed to believe or yes disinformation would be about inserting purposely incorrect content and trying to make it uh, go viral um, in, in order to, in order to um, make a point or create division. An example of that would be, um, because it's important to draw a distinction, disinformation is, to, is when we talk about bots and bot networks. That is where you will, you will, if you see someone on social media, say on Twitter without a logo, um, without a profile picture, or with a name with numbers in, and you see them retweeting things or sharing something, actually, if you were to copy and paste that into Twitter, you probably see a lot of accounts posting that exact same thing. Mm. No profile pictures, no, uh, accounts with numbers in them. They, they, those, that's a, a, a very easy way to spot a, a bot campaign that is spreading disinformation. So now we're in the, in the middle of a COVID crisis and um, you are working for WHO. Uh, uh, to tackle misinformation. So what is now uh, this misinformation or disinformation uh, doing to our society when we're trying to uh, tackle this kind of a horrible pandemic? Yeah, so we, we're working on a project with the WHO called Viral Facts. And this is slightly different because I guess it's more misinformation here. So it's, it's rumors that are going around. I heard that the vaccine did this, or I heard that this helps me. If I uh, breathe in uh, steam, that kills COVID and I don't actually need to get a vaccination. Or if I take this up. So it's, it's this kind of situation where rumors and, every, and stories and anecdotes that people hear and friend, I've got a friend who did this, that is, in society, that is where we've we've got the problem with with vaccine hesitancy and vaccine misinformation, and so the way we tackle that is really different. We there's no big campaign that's going to say don't listen to your auntie. We have to come up with a completely new methodology to say instead of you know don't don't tell your auntie off, but maybe share this with your auntie to show. Um, why why their belief about steam inhalation or a herbal remedy or a, a worry that something very specific in her town is happening um share this with her and and, and help her to understand why that's that's not the case or, or why it, the opposite is the case so we we try to tap into what a community is feeling what they're hearing what they're talking about um and target content and messaging to in a, in a lot more personal way to 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 tackle a, a case of misinformation so what is then the fact i mean you said fact checking what is yeah. the fact? i mean i i guess that's a you know there are different facts as well how do you yes. think what is then the real fact that you based on uh you know your kind of work on and yeah. what is then 
not so trustworthy fact. Yes. So a fact is something that can be, I guess, checked. It's not an opinion. It is not a statement of, um, it's not a positioning statement. So a fact would be, um, you know, on this day in 1965, there were 5,000 people who did this uh, and, you know, turned up at this event. We would look back at a historical record we would um, find the evidence and we would be able to, I guess, claim that as a fact. Um, we use, uh, when I do training, we talk, we use the example of actually of 5G. So 5G is in the airwaves uh, and, it's, and it's a conspiracy theory by a tech entrepreneur. Yeah. Well, none of that is, is, um, is fact, it's it's opinion or it's or it's a claim that, that can't be checked. Um, if we talk about, we can talk about 5G operates between these specific frequencies, that can be a fact that can be checked. 5G is rolled out across a certain number of networks, that can be checked. So it's it's this kind of personal opinion or generalized comments, not facts, or even though they could actually be fact, they could be factual and they could be correct. But when we're looking to fact check something, we're looking for numbers, dates, uh, quotes that are on record. All, all of these things are things that we can we can check. Other things we'll just end up arguing about because yeah. they come down to personal preference or opinion. Okay, then if um, you know we had what impact we work with uh, companies, charities, social enterprises, grant makers, and all all of them have an intention to make us you know, some kind of a change, positive change in society. Uh, their work can be sometimes hard. You know, a lot of resources are kind of wasted just because you have to tackle misinformation, I would say, or disinformation. And also it might be uh, very hard for charities or social enterprises to kind of do their beneficiary work because there are certain beliefs or rumors uh, going around. What could like these beneficiary organizations or what should they do in terms of this kind of comms work because if there is an underlying like a rumor and misinformation going it doesn't matter how much you try to help if people are not accepting your help or yep. the solution what you're trying to offer so what should they do if when they are even thinking of tackling something how should they analyze the situation in terms of this kind of fake in information so there are a few things to do and it and and actually, it's a it's a, a kind of common problem or a common uh, strategic thinking issue for for, for anyone who, who wants to deal with this. So it sounds like a cliche, but you have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. And it's much easier to get a handle on these things if you're prepared rather than if you're putting out fires. So when we're talking about preparedness here, we are, I guess, thinking about what exercises could you do in the same way that you would do some kind of risk management to identify in advance what people might be talking about that could be problematic, where there could be room for misinterpretation, um, and to start monitoring uh, places where these rumors may appear before, before the case. So that as soon as there is a rumor, as soon as someone may be get the, the wrong idea or, or something or, or need to be, the record needs to be corrected, you're able to identify where that is happening and uh, proactively um, deal with it in the moment. The, uh, on the other end of that, um, you need to also not fuel the flames for something. Mm. So all of us can be drawn into social media, feel that social media, social media is the real world, but it's also um, algorithmically served to you. So you may feel if you're being sent all of this stuff all the time, or you're, you're, it's the only thing you see, you may feel that it's a bigger deal than it actually is. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about rumors and fighting, fighting rumors and, and addressing claims, we have to analyze whether it's reached a certain level of, of impact or a certain level of reach and if it and that's going to be unique to the organization uh, to anyone's organization but don't jump on it before it's reached and if it's just one person you don't need to put something out on social media yeah if it's five people in a small organization you might if it's a thousand people in a big organization you should um, but you don't want to give give air to the rumor 
uh, that would and, and potentially, yeah, give it more traction and more reach than the original thing did. Mm. So what role does uh, like cultural differences uh, play in misinformation? Uh, I would say it's it's one of the major factors for, for misinformation. A cultural difference, uh, firstly, in the way that people interact with information. Um, secondly, in terms of the way that people interact with their peer groups and their networks. Um, so to give an example, we do, do work fight, fighting misinformation in India, where um, WhatsApp groups are very, very popular for families and memes get shared in them, photos and video and claims. And there's a potentially a hierarchy in there that you don't, you, you know, if you are a young person in the family, you don't question your elders. Uh, if they share something. So culturally, it's really difficult to, to counter misinformation coming from family members because you don't want to create conflict. So to deal with that though, you have to think about, well, how can, how can people be provided with external resources so that they don't have to challenge, they're not the one to, to challenge their family member. If we think about um, places that are used to, uh, I guess, used to propaganda, let's say. Um, so I've done work in, in Eastern Europe and on, on countries that border uh, other countries that are, are particularly good at propaganda or, or have messages that they want to, to deal with. In those countries, they are so used to it. They, you, they can spot uh, propaganda and misinformation and, and kind of process, process it in a, in, in, a, in a way that is just or, or kind of auto, also almost automatic these days and, and take it with a pinch of salt and understand that it will have a slant. So the, the culture of media in a country, the culture of social media, also uh, we forget in the UK here, we use WhatsApp a lot. Um, mm. In the US, they don't use WhatsApp at all. And so culturally that's, that's a very different way that information uh, is shared and spread. So yes, culture in, in all of its senses has a, has a big part to play in the way that misinformation operates or doesn't operate um, in communities or geographies. Yeah. Uh, so you've been uh, working kind of for and financed, your work has been financed by the biggest social media houses and uh, internet companies like Google and Facebook and, and WhatsApp. Uh, so what is what do you feel and what do they feel is their responsibility in, in this just owning the media kind of the platform where all this happen? Yes, yeah, so um, the work that we do on this tends to be uh, that is that is funded by the platforms tends to be collaborations with other news organizations as well. So um, and there is a very clear barrier between uh, funder support and editorial output say so that's one way that we that we kind of institute the separation of church and state can we t we can tackle um, misinformation on a tech platform but it is using advice and strategy from editorial uh, exp editorially experienced journalists and newsrooms in order to do that um, but it does there but it also allows us to get insight into the platforms. It allows us to um, make sure if we understand how the platform works, because we're working with those organizations, we get to um, understand best practice for content creation, which means that it's um, we've got a better chance of, of reaching people. So it's it is a fine line working with these with these platforms. But ultimately, I think it's it's better to work together because we can kind of hold each other to account rather than not working at all or not being prepared to work at all at all with them because ultimately the problem is on those platforms. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's been a lot of shift from like traditional journalism to kind of everybody being journalist <laughs> I would say or at least, um, you know, uh, kind of, uh, I've been doing quite a lot of uh, like public relations work throughout my career. And I can just see that the kind of the journalistic departments, the editorial departments are getting smaller and smaller and, and uh, everybody 
shares news and you know in different channels and you kind of not know what is reliable source so what do you think uh, about the state of traditional media is there this kind of independent uh, journalism still or is it vanishing and everybody has become their own journalist there's definitely independent media still and there are journalists working at news organizations uh, they're working very very hard on mm -hmm. creating independent original journalism it's an there's obviously an economic issue here probably people watching or listening to this if i said are you paying for media a lot of people would go oh no 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 i'm not i, I can get a lot of it for free that obviously contributes to the the way that journalism is funded and or not funded and and how many independent journalists there are out there is, yeah. is dependent on that um whether we are all journal whether everyone is a journalist or everyone has i do believe now that everyone has a stake in a higher stake in news and and information and bears some responsibility in terms of what they what they produce and also understanding how they consume news uh, i think it's really important that people understand how algorithms work and the content that they are served is determined by their previous activity um and content that they share and and but content that they share is is potentially attached to their name or attached to maybe influenced by uh, by external players or, or or motives so we might we may or may not all be journalists but we definitely all have a responsibility to understand how we consume media and responsibility for what we share yeah what what do you uh, think if we go to uh, purely for companies and um you know uh, i'm looking for now corporate social responsibility kind of point of view here that what should any company do uh you know in terms of um you know kind of helping out keeping things on the right track kind of in facts and yep. uh you know what is their responsibility uh towards the external partners but also the employees so i think transparency um is is incredibly important um there's no fast way to build up a credible rep reputation um so so transparency is important because we can see whether it's whether it's a donor whether it's a journalist whether it's uh, a, a citizen or a member of a, a, a resident in, in any country if someone wants to understand more about you they have to be able to do some some basic um research and you have to be able to create you know make sure that that your operations are transparent to to your stakeholders so from a journalistic point of view um i always if if someone wants to get a story in the media and you're quoting a report you have to provide the original report as well if mm -hmm. you're quoting statistics you have to be able to back up where those statistics statistics come from it's not a lot of work but it's around that preparedness that I was talking about before. If you what you need to give people access, they may never seek out those figures, but just to know that they're there sets a, a, an excellent tone for moving forward. And it means that it's built into your workflows and process for how you share information with, with your stakeholders. Uh, we have what impact, you know, uh, we, we are trying to tackle this with our kind of a product in, in terms of that. Um, I, I don't think companies intentionally uh, try to present themselves like in a better light in terms of social value creation or what they have contributed to the society. Uh, but uh, sometimes they just don't have the impact details. Uh, nobody has from the beneficiary side, you know, charities, social enterprises that they've been funded. They maybe haven't measured or reported enough and then there's an intention for companies to try to report what they achieved with their contribution. Obviously, our philosophy is that the company cannot do that unless they actually did the beneficiary work, the work on the ground, because only those players who are actually doing the work can measure and then report. And that's why we have now built a, a social impact reporting tool where the actual beneficiary organizations report in quite a detailed way and put this evidence attachment and uh, you know it can be qualitative quantitative research and and all kind of interviews based and and even photo evidence or video evidence 
but they will report back. So then the companies could like re report to their stakeholders in a truthful manner what they actually achieved uh, with their contributions. So yeah, uh, we are in a sense also trying to tackle these little misinformation that might be out there or that there is no information at all. I guess that is one part of this, that if there is not enough information, that is also misinformation. <laughs> is it? Yeah, but I, I think that that, uh, that approach is, is solid because you, you're basically building up a record and, and you, everyone then has a track record and people can refer to it. And some people may never, but it's there if people want it. And, and um, it can't be faked. It takes time to do. There are, there's going to be transparency around the process. It's that that gives people reassurance. So it, it's, I think it's a positive shift that a lot of industries, a lot of organizations have to be more accountable, have to show, show their work in order to um, claim a certain status. Um, I think that's a, if there's so many negative things that have happened in this in this period with the way information is shared I, I think that that is a shift to the positive that's going to help society in years to come that 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 driving force to to share information or make the record accessible yeah i i totally agree <laughs> yeah yeah definitely so uh what would be your like last words here in, in this podcast for any organization, you know, what would be the first steps if they haven't really tackled, you know, this misinformation or disinformation ever, what would be like the first steps to take uh, if, we're, if they'd like to build some kind of a practice around this? Yeah, so the first step would be don't freak out because the chances are that uh, the chance that you are going to be the victim of a disinformation campaign is, is pretty remote. Um, the chance that someone may misunderstand something that you've that you've put out is is greater, um, and and but that's really that you've got to kind of manage your manage your fears and, and understand what the real risks are. The second thing I would do is be prepared and, and think about um, where there are those risks, map them out, and understand um, what it means for something to be escalated. So earlier we talked about understanding whether this is a fire that you need to put out or whether it will put itself out. Um, and then it's about building a process to deal with it and creating the resources that you need to either have available to people who want to check out your track record mm -hmm. um, or resources that you need for your team to be able to share in order to counter um, misinformation. Um, but I think it's also best to think about this as a positive. So what do you, what can you share to, to show off how transparent you are, to show off how you work, so that you never actually have to get to the point where someone can misunderstand, uh, mm. or, or and, and if they do, it's very easy to correct that record. Yeah, and I guess it's the same thing that in a, any kind of like a customer experience, sometimes the most disappointed or cynical, and in this case, somebody might be cynical or doubtful, they, they actually, you know, uh, you know, kind of become your fans if you are fully prepared. Like in the customer journey, if somebody's super dissatisfied with the product and then you make a proper compensation and deal with nicely, they become your fan. And I guess in this sense as well, that even uh, the doubters or people who kind of don't believe in you or, or, or kind of don't share your views might be actually turning to your favor because you are prepared. You know, and you, you have evidence and you are you are kind of ready and 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 there is a process and people can start to trust you that you have actually thought about these things exactly and sometimes those people that don't trust you are not trusting you because you've done anything wrong it's it's just who they are and they probably got the loudest voice but you shouldn't let that put you off you should focus on gaining the trust of people that you that you know you can and that can become those those fans and supporters through transparent practices yeah okay thank you so much for because this has been so thank interesting you. uh where, where do people uh, get more information um so your website website is fathom.co uh dot co and that's where you'll find it everything and on twitter fathom co is on yeah. twitter handle and Fergus Bell on, on LinkedIn, your profile. Fergus Bell on LinkedIn and Fergby on Twitter. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, have a good weekend. Thanks very much. <laughs>